What was the impact of the Austrian school of economic thought on Marxian economic analysis? Join Richard Ebeling and me in this week's Libertarian Angle as we examine that question. Hi, I'm Jacob Hornberger, president of the Future of Freedom Foundation, and welcome to this week's Libertarian Angle, the show that you all know brings you the principled and compromising case for the libertarian philosophy, including economic analysis. I'm joined by my co-host, Richard Ebeling, professor of economics at the Citadel. Richard, good to see you again. Good to see you and to be with our viewers and listeners as we're approaching this happy holiday season. Yeah, thank you all for tuning in. Um, if you haven't yet read my end-of-year fundraising letter, I would invite you to do so. It's there at our website at fff.org. We could sure use your support. We get donations throughout the year, of course, for which we're very grateful. But this end of year is really important to us. This is where the lion's share of the, the money comes in that funds our operations over the next year. And we could sure use your support in advancing liberty. This is how we survive. It's how all the educational foundation and think tanks survive. No government assistance, of course. It's all voluntary support. And if you've never donated to FFF, this would be a great time to start. And so we'd greatly appreciate your generous support and any amount that you are able to send us. All right, Richard. So we've had this series on classical economists. I didn't know it was going to go this long, but I've enjoyed it. I hope our viewers have enjoyed it as well. We started out with Adam Smith's His Wealth of Nations, the Great Economics Treatise. We went into David Ricardo, John Stuart Mill, uh, Malthus, uh, Bastiat. I mean, I, I think that our viewers have gotten a really nice overview of the classical school, the classical economists here. And uh, thanks to your excellent expositions. And then we, we spent... Oh, a couple sessions on Karl Marx because he was sort of the the, the last of the uh, of the classical economists, it seems. Um, and then that's where we start getting into the Austrian school, the Austrian school of economics with Karl Menger and Eugen von Bomberwerk, uh, Wieser, uh, Ludwig von Mises, and so forth. Which, in my opinion, and I think the opinion of every Austrian economist, every libertarian, leveled a devastating critique against. Marx's concepts. Uh, but we're still dealing with those today, as I'm sure you'll explain in today's um, exposition on, on Karl Marx and the Austrian school. So take it away, Richard. Thank you. Well, uh, as Jacob was saying, we've been discussing Marx. We talked a bit about originally at first Marx the man. Uh, we talked about his theory of historical uh, materialism and supposedly this trajectory that history must follow. Uh, from primitive society to feudal society to capitalism to his vision of a future socialist and then a communist utopia. Uh, we talked a bit about uh, the, the limits, shortcomings, and uh, fundamental uh, misconceptions of uh, the labor theory of value, which underlies his theory of exploitation, uh, which originated from the classical economists. Uh, while he reached conclusions different than Adam Smith or David Ricardo or John Stuart Mill, the fact is, is that uh, in, in the sense of where he got his ideas and then took them in his particular path, uh, he was a child of the classical economists in that sense. But um, as I was explaining when we finished last time, uh, Marx's conception of exploitation is that uh, the workers are, are the ultimate producers of all the output of the society. Uh, when it comes to machinery, well, how did the machinery get built? Why well, workers also. So uh, uh, machinery, capital, physical capital, is merely sort of a, a, an objectified and, and concretized form of previous or earlier labor, which then gives us gives ex current labor uh, a helping hand in producing desired goods. <clears throat> and Marx's conception is that all of this output would go to those who had... Uh, produced it, the workers themselves, if not for the, 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 the institution of private property in, uh, in the means of production, especially uh, land, resources, capital, equipment, machinery, uh, that is uh, unnaturally, uh, artificially, uh, arbitrarily uh, owned 
owned, uh, seized and, and owned by a small segment of the society known as the capitalists. And since the capitalists have this exclusive ownership and right of access to these physical means of production, land and resources and machinery, uh, the worker who without their assistance would starve must uh, come and entreat the capitalist to let him work with them. And as I was explaining last time, we could imagine an example, uh, the worker with the assistance of resources and machinery uh, could produce, let's say, 10 units of output in a day. If the worker were to receive the full value of his labor, then the worker would receive 10 units of output. But the capitalist says, well, I will give you access to my physical means of production, the factory, the machinery, the resources, the raw materials. Uh, if we have this arrangement where you produce 10 units of output during the day, uh, but your day's pay will be the equivalent of seven units of output. And I will keep three of the units that your labor has produced with these other ingredients uh, as, as my deserved uh, income from having let you have access to that which I own. And this is what repulses uh, uh, Marx. Uh, why should someone, uh, in a sense, uh, extract uh, the fruits of another man's labor by merely the arbitrary claim that he owns the tools without which the worker could not survive? And th that is the fundamental notion of Marx's theory of exploitation and of social injustice, and that the only way to eliminate this is to abolish this private ownership of the means of production and to transfer them and their use to the workers as a whole, the proletariat, the productive class, and that that would then assure that those who had produced received the full value of the rewards. Now, <clears throat> as I was explaining also last time, Jacob, if one thinks about it in these terms, there's a certain logic to it. And you see, Marx says that the three units of output out of the 10 that the worker produces, that the capitalist keeps as his own, that's his profit. That's the exploitive profit that he acquires off the productive back of another. And this only came to be fully challenged in, I think, a cogent and persuasive and insightful way uh, with the arrival of the Austrian school in the seven, 1870s and 1880s and 90s. Uh, the founder of the Austrian school was Karl Menger, who we've touched upon and talked about uh, tangentially. Uh, and he argued that the classical theory of value uh, was, uh, was, was backwards or wrong si side up. Uh, the Marxists and the classical economists assumed that goods had value precisely because labor had been uh, inputted to it. Uh, in that example, if it takes a day labor to down a deer and uh, a day labor to for a trapper to successfully capture two beaver in his traps, then uh, each of the good is worth, in relative terms, one deer for two beaver, equivalent to the labor time that's involved in their uh, capture and availability for human use. Uh, and that, therefore, that determines the value of things as measured by the quantity of labor that has gone into their production manufacture availability. Uh, Men Menger said that that's, that has it backwards. Uh, it is because goods have value to us, personal, subjective, of value to us, that we decide that it is worth investing labor. Why should you devote a day's labor uh, to hunting a deer or trying to trap two beaver? Because de beaver and deer have value for our human uses. Uh, it, is the, it is the value of the end that therefore assigns, imputes, gives meaning and assigned value to the means. So it's because a product has value to us for our ultimate uses that we think it is worth giving a certain amount of labor and other resources to their manufacture. So it is the end that gives value to the means, not the means that gives value to the end. And of course, Menger develops this in, in his, his 1871 book, which in English is simply called Principles of Economics. But the particular form in which I wanted to talk about this uh, in response to uh, Marx, uh, is, is that Bumbavark, who uh, was a follower of Menger, he and his fellow student at the time in the 1870s, 
uh, Friedrich Wieser, had attended the University of Vienna, but had not taken classes with Menger, um, but had instead, uh, shortly uh, after Menger himself had taken up an appointment at the university, but they had graduated, they came across his book. And his book seemed to open a world to them. And each of them then decided to devote a large part of their intellectual career to trying to tease out, develop, uh, further extend in very in different ways uh, the insights that they saw in Menger's book. Uh, in the case of Bumbavark, uh, the particular uh, specialization that he chose for himself was explaining the theory of capital and interest. And for our purposes, what what Bumbavark says is that Marx has confused two things that are quite different and viewed them as as if they're the same, and that is profit and interest. Uh, Marx says that, 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 that what the capitalist earns is, is profit uh, because he uh, extracts some amount of the worker's output as his own. Uh, and that's the injustice of capitalist profit. But Bombardic says, well, let's think of a market as open, free, and competitive. And let us suppose that some uh, enterpriser, some businessman, uh, is successfully selling a product that the consumer value placed upon it is greater than his costs of manufacturing it. Uh, and therefore, he has a profit margin. Uh, if, in fact, this is the case, and if the market is open, free, and competitive, we would expect that over time, uh, other capitalists, other businessmen, other entrepreneurs would see a profit opportunity. And they would enter his segment or sector of the market and try to capture some of the profits for themselves. And how would they do so? Well, first, they would also employ, hire, use resources uh, to try to make their versions of his product. But to do so, they would have to draw resources, including labor, into their employments. And so in the process, they would be often tending to be bidding up workers' salaries. Don't work for Sam over there. Work for me. I'll pay you an extra 50 cents an hour. And that's how you draw scarce resources into your a direction or a corner of the market instead of someone else's. At the same time, besides bidding up the factor prices and trying to expand output in this profit-making ent enterprises sector of the market, when product when they when they had successfully made their versions of the product and brought it on the market to offer to consumers, how do you attract consumer business compared to that profit-making seller? Don't buy from George. Buy from me, and I'll sell it to you for a dollar less. So in the process of competitive rivalry, um, input prices will be uh, competed up. The selling price will ultimately be competed down to attract consumer business. And at the end of the day, the tendency, the point towards which any market is, is, is moving is the competitive elimination of profit. And that in the long run, through this process, no firm would make profits if no other changes were to enter that corner of the market so that ultimately total revenues would equal total costs. Now, if that's the case, if, if, if we understand the general logic of a competitive market in that way, where's the profit of the capitalist? So Bombavik then says that what Menger, has, excuse me, is what Marx has failed to understand is the origin, purpose, and role and significance of interest. And what Bumbabrick tells us is that let's keep in mind that all production takes time. Um, if I want a cup of tea, I have to heat the kettle. I have to uh, pour it into a mug. I have to put a tea bag into the uh, hot water. I have to let it steep a while. I might have to add some sweetener if that's to my taste. I have to let it cool slightly so it doesn't scold my mouth. And then I have the cup of tea to drink. All production takes time. If we want uh, a loaf of bread, long before we have the, the desire for that loaf of bread, either we or someone has to clear a field, lay the farrows, plant the seeds, irrigate the land, tend it and shoo away the crows as the crop is growing so that the mature wheat can be harvested and then at a flour mill and a baking facility be transformed into the bread that we hope to have as a sandwich when we desire it. And all that would have taken an immense amount of time, a year or more. So all production takes time. 
The problem is, is that when you say that production takes time, what do you do? What do you live on while you're waiting for this production process to finish, such as a loaf of bread to eat, uh, over this over the period of production? Now, uh, Bombarberg, developing aspects of Menger, talks about how 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 capital involves a process of savings and investment. We have to put aside some of the output, the productions that we have produced as the means by which we can live off while we are manufacturing the product we're interested in. The, the, the simplest case would be the following, Jacob. Imagine that you're Robinson Crusoe on your, on your isolated and, and island and uh, you're trying to catch fish. Well, you, you could wade out into the lagoon and try to catch fish with your hands, but that's not going to be very productive. Uh, you could take a little bit of time to pull a sturdy branch off a tree, sharpen one end of the branch on a rock to have a spear, and try to wade into one's waist and try to catch fish with the spear. And you might have a bit of luck, but your food output from fish is not going to be very great. Or you can incur another process of production. You could make the simple tools, uh, a saw, a hatchet, that would enable you to cut down a tree. And having cut down the tree, you would remove the branches. And then with the trunk of the tree, you would carve out uh, what would end up being the place where you would sit in a canoe. You would hollow it out. But then you have to take other branches and, 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 and manufacture off those branches and shaping them the, 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 the paddles to, to, to be able to maneuver the canoe in the water. And then you'd have to pull the vines off the trees and, and weave them into a net. Now, when you have had done this, uh, made the tools, cut down the tree, hollowed it out into a canoe, uh, made, made the paddles out of branches of the tree, and then woven the, the, the vines off the trees into the net, you could then uh, paddle out deeper into the water off, off your isolated island's coastline, drop the net in, and then in the deeper water, you're likely to capture a multitude of fish of a greater variety all at one time. So you will have produced more fo food for yourself. But this is a time-consuming process. While, while you have been cutting down the tree and making the tools to do so and making the, the net and all the other things, what are you living on? Well, out of your less capital-intensive production, you would have had to put berries aside or find a way to salt some of the fish you had caught by hand or with the spear so you could eat it during the period of production while you're making the capital that will enable you to have more and better output in the future. So before you can have future output through the use of capital produ production processes, you have to save. Now, the, the worker could save in some way, but his income may be too meager or he might have the patience to do so. But if there is someone who's willing to save, or uh, and to put some of the output that he had manufactured in the past set aside as what he will live off or what he will pay to others to be living off while he hires them to make something, then the product can be done. So what Bombardier basically says is that what the capitalist is doing is advancing goods to the workers that are not yet, yet produced that is of the own product they're manufacturing. So that what the capitalist is doing is he is saving the workers the inconvenience or the hardship or the difficulty or impossibility of waiting until the production process is finished and the product hopefully has been sold at a price that consumers are willing to pay that covers his expenses over the production process to then pay the workers their wages. The workers could wait until the production process is finished. And then the capitalist entrepreneur sells it he has his revenues and he pays the workers what, uh, what, what he owes them. Or he can be paying them during the production process. And they eat and they have a place to live and they have the amenities and conveniences of life, in a sense, living off his prior accumulated savings. Or if he has borrowed some of it, because his own savings won't permit the production process to be fully undertaken out of his own resources, the, save, save, the, the, the borrowed savings of others which he's then advancing to the workers during the production process. So what basically workers are receiving is the, 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 the reward for, for, for production now, the output of which will not be available until the future. And so what Bambabrik says is that we have to ask ourselves the question, 
what is future output worth relative today? And the answer is it's not worth as much. If I, if I have a choice, all other things held given, of eating a loaf of bread today or a loaf of bread a year from now, I prefer to have the loaf of bread today. If you ask me, would I rather have a set of clothes available to use today versus that same set of clothes, all other things held the same a year from now, I prefer to have the suit today. So when would I be willing to forego to set aside uh, the use and availability of the resources that would enable me to have a suit or food or any other amenity today? Well, if someone makes it more worth my worthwhile to forego current consumption, to undertake savings production that will bring forth a good in the future. So what Bambavrik says is that yes, the product that that the that the that the workers assist in manufacturing sells for a higher price in the future than the costs of production, including their own labor services, have 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 been as a layout by the employer. But that gap between the cost of production and the final selling price is not profit. It's interest. It's the implicit interest that the capitalist earns by advancing workers uh, as salaries and incomes to the workers today with only the hope and the expectation that he'll receive a price in the future that has made it all worthwhile for him to not only maybe earn a profit over everything else, but to forgo his own current consumption over the period of production. So that what the workers are being done is being they're being benefited by the capitalists. He's the one who's not taking advantage of all that he could do over the period of production, all the consumption enjoyments. He's foregoing that. He's sacrificing that. He's giving that up to advance wages to the workers and the other suppliers of resources today with only the hope of the reward in the future. So basically what, 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 what the capitalist is receiving is the interest income for foregoing current consumption for a future gain. And the workers are gaining from that because they don't have to wait till the product is finished to be sold to get their wage reward. They get it during the production process at the expense and the availability of what the capitalists can give them. And therefore Marx has totally misunderstood the capitalist process. And by doing so, he's created a sense of exploitation and injustice when in fact what the capitalist does is make life easier for the workers. He incurs the waiting until the product can be sold and a reward can be received. They don't have to wait. They get their wages every week, every month, all the months over the production periods until the product is ready to be sold. And that therefore it is not exploitation, but it is an understanding that the capitalist is receiving, the entrepreneur capitalist is receiving a, a, a market compensation for, for going pleasures in the present to gain something in the future. And in the meantime, part of that sacrifice is giving and paying wages to the workers today so they don't have to make the time sacrifice that he does. Yeah, you really explain it well. I mean, it it it, it explains why the capitalist is not exploiting the worker at all, that he's entitled to be paid yes. for, what, for this service. I mean, yes. and he's also taking the risk, Richard, because yes. there's no guarantee that the product's going to sell at the end of this process. Exactly. See, all of the, all of the workers that he employs are operating under contract. The, he has agreed that if, if they perform certain services rendered under his businessman's oversight in the production process, every week, every two weeks, every month, they'll get their wages. And he's laying out those wages out of either his own savings or savings that he's borrowed from others. And only when the product is ready to be sold does he present it on the market to the ultimate consumers. Now, will they want the product? Maybe yes, maybe no. Uh, will they be will they be willing to pay a price for the units of output made that will cover all of his expenses of having used either his or other people's savings to make that good by paying workers and other resource providers their wages or incomes? Maybe yes and maybe no. Or will he make a profit? Maybe yes or maybe no. Will he suffer a loss? Because what the consumer is willing to compensate him for, with is less than his expenses and he suffers a loss. Maybe yes, maybe no. He's the bearer of the risk and the uncertainty. The workers have no such equivalent risk and uncertainty because they're being paid for services rendered as the production process is being followed through. He bears all of the uncertainty and risk of not knowing whether he will receive a price when he sells the product that compensates for all of the expenses he's had, including the time sacrifice that he either has incurred or is still responsible to pay back 
to those who've lended them their savings to do this. Yeah, and, uh, you know, theoretically, he could be offering the workers at the very beginning of this process saying, look, why don't you take the risk with me? I don't pay you anything, but at the end, if we come out, we share. And that's certainly a possibility. It's what a partnership is all about. Right. But many people don't want to take that risk, Richard. That they they have families to support. Uh, they they want that guaranteed income coming in every two weeks or so. And so they say, no, thank you. Just pay me the what we've agreed on here, and you take the entire risk. And so everybody gets presumably compensated. The workers getting compensated, and at the end, hopefully the the businessman is going to sell this product. He's built a nice car, you know, like Tesla or whatever, and he makes a lot of money off it, which enables him to then expand operations and hire more workers. But it, but it's, I think one of the important things here is that the capitalist is actually performing a great benefit for the workers. I mean, it's a mutual process. Obviously, he couldn't do it without the workers. But let's assume these people are starving to death, which was the case in the Middle Ages and so forth. And then the Industrial Revolution comes along and the capitalist says, hey, I'm going to start this business. You, you want to come and work here for me? Wages aren't going to be high, but they're better than starving to death. So he's actually benefiting mankind by performing this risk, taking this risk of losing everything. Yes. The, 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 the capitalist, the, the businessman capitalist, is basically saving all the others in society who he employs from both the uncertainties and the risk that he has to bear. What if he chose not to bear that risk? Well, then the workers themselves would have to grow their own food. But then if they have to grow their own food, they have to then clear the field. They have to cut out the farrows in the soil. They have to plant the seed. They have to irrigate it while it's growing. They have to shoo away those crows that, as it's reaching maturity, they have to do the harvesting and they then will either have, have it to consume themselves or to sell in the market for other things they want. But how will have they have lived? If they've not had savings to live off during that, in my example, an agricultural period of production, if they've not set, set aside or been able to set aside output from past harvests, how would they be surviving during the current cycle of, of agriculture? They couldn't. But the person who hires them and is paying the wages while they're assisting in that simplified example of a farm growing a crop, but it's nonetheless the essence of this logic, he's, he's, he's forwarding them and giving them portions of the savings he has set aside in the past so they can currently have things to consume and eat while he's waiting to maybe be compensated in the future when he has the harvest to sell. So yes, he's performing an essential service of saving the workers from either having to delay consumption or to have to have had savings of their own in the past and incurred that sacrifice in waiting for it to mature. Yeah, and I think I, we're about out of time, but I wanted to emphasize also, you know, the the title of Bastia, one of Bastia's books, Mut no, Economic Harmonies, yes. that contrary to what Marx says there is no conflict between the worker and the employer and the business owner. They all have a harmony of interests here. They all have an interest in having this business succeed because if more revenues come in, then the, the employer has more money to pay higher wages. And how do they ensure that? Well, not through the benevolence of the employer because the other farmers and other businessmen and other endeavors in the surrounding area are also prospering and they're going to be competing for those workers. And that's what drives the wage ridges up. So everybody's got an interest in a prospering business as well as a prospering society. Right. If, if you think of the production process as not a one of conflict, but of complementarity, one person pro is providing labor, but uh, is not willing or able to defer his own consumption until the product is ready because he doesn't have the savings to live off. Another person in this complementary relationship has, has been able to and is willing to forgo current uses of his savings uh, of the past to make it available to assist the worker. Another person is supplying resources that have, have been mined or extracted in the past and are and he has the means to receive wages for uh, income from for providing it to the to the to the businessman 
all are providing complementary activities in the production process. Uh, we often talk about division of labor, the butcher, the baker, and the candlestick maker. Well, that also means the worker, the resource supplier, and the businessman, and the saver capitalist. All of them are cooperating uh, in the manufacture of a product where each of them is able to do something that the others cannot as easily do, but they assist each other in this way. It's, it's, it's a cooperative process, not a, a, an exploitive competitive process. Okay. All right. The $64,000 question. Are we wrapped up now with the classical economists? Uh, we are certainly wrapped up with uh, Marx. Uh, other than I would just add one or two things. Uh, you know, w w a lot of people say, well, who's the real Marx? Uh, oh, is there the young Marx? Is there the old Marx? Is there the social justice Marx? Is the revolutionary uh, 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 dictatorship Marx? It's all Marx. I would just say is that we've been focusing on, on a sense, quote, the abstract economics of it labor theory of value, his definition of exploitation, the logic of the production process, profit and interest, you know, all these rarefied stuff that economists like to talk about. But the fact is that the other side of Marx is that because he, he believed in his own analysis, he believed in revolution. The capitalists will not give up the ownership of their means of production without a fight. And therefore, the workers will eventually have to rise up and undertake a revolution. But who's going to guide this revolution? And he refers to it as a vanguard of the proletariat, an elite who has a greater in-depth understanding of vision and appreciation of this historical process. And they must lead the revolution and they must bring the, the masses together as a force under their leadership to overthrow the old system and create the new. And since many of the workers will suffer from a false consciousness of not understanding why the whole capitalist system was wrong, well, they need to be re-educated. They need it to be guided. They have to be propagandized. They have to be controlled. In the system in which they were are now as the vanguard, the true vanguard and revolutionaries to assist mankind will be the central planners, the political leaders, the determiners of the destinies of the society as a whole for the good of the workers, because they have a greater insight and vision of where, what it's all about than the common man. And that explains why we're these systems have come to power. It has been done sometimes through a ballot box, but always through ultimately force. Nationalized industries, do you think the owner of that nationalized industry was happy to give it up? No. Imposition of various forms of central planning where all must conform and are confined within the plan that the planners impose on all members of the society? Do you think everyone in the society is happy to be made into, put into the straitjacket of a central plan? No. And then there's the fact that to assure their power, they have to propagandize, control what people know, how they understand it, an elite of indoctrination. And do you think every person, if they reflect upon it in the society, likes to be mind manipulated? No. But it is that conception of the tyranny of the system in the good of humanity that is the arrogance and the hubris and the ultimate evil of those who follow the Marxian ideas to its logical conclu conclusion. And in the name of creating utopia, they create a hell. Yeah, it's fascinating how Marx's ideas are still so dominant, even though people may not be re realizing that so dominant today. Yes. Uh, and we see it in all these issues of wokeism and political correctness and 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 an ethnic identity uh all of these are variations uh consciously sometimes unconsciously but mostly consciously taken out of the marxian roots out of which they've grown instead of a class struggle we talk about gender struggle we talk about ethnic or racial struggle uh it, it instead of the capitalist versus the workers it's the white male capitalist who exploits women and all people of color you, you you've changed the little pigeonholes slightly but it's the same perverse logic and the same presumptions and premises that marx laid down over 150 years ago and continued to plague humankind okay on that note we'll wrap it up thank you for tuning in thank you richard for the great exposition explanation of cl the classical school of economics uh we're going to be taking a break next week christmas week and so we'll plan to see you after New Year's and the new year and 
Thank you again. For those of you that have already donated to FFF here end of year, thank you very much for your support. For those of you that have not yet donated, we would greatly appreciate your support. And a very Merry Christmas and Happy New Year to you, Richard, and your family, and to all of our friends and supporters at the Future Freedom Foundation. Happy holidays, everyone, and keep FFF in mind.